All right, well, um, my name is Tim Reeder. I'm the Biomass Program Specialist for the Colorado State Forest Service. Um, as Han mentioned earlier this morning, I'm part of the Swery Wood Utilization Team under a grant from the U.S. Forest Service, so I've enjoyed uh, the past year or so um, working with uh, some of my former colleagues uh, across the border in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, we're going to continue for our next panel on this um, topic of value-added products from small diameter timber. Um, we're going to hear a couple presentations on a couple of products that kind of keep that innovation theme, taking lower value wood and uh, finding uh, value-added product applications. And then uh, one of our other presenters and panelists will be um, providing some perspectives on commercialization on several technologies looking at um, uh, increasing the profit potential of um, wood residues, wood waste, low value wood, that kind of thing. So a as we've done in our previous panel, we'll just I'll just invite our speakers up individually. We'll hold the Q&A until after all three have given us um, their perspectives. Um, um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our first panelist, Martin Twer. I've known Martin several years now. Initially, in the context of his biomass, renewable energy, and extension work with uh, University of Montana, um, and then subsequently in his current role with the Watershed Center, um, where he's delving into biomass utilization at local, state, and regional levels, technologies, processes, policies. So um, I'm happy to have known Martin for several years. Martin's going to talk to us. Um, one of his uh, newer hobbies is looking into a product called wood wool cement, something that uh, has been, uh, from my understanding, adopted pretty well in Europe. And Martin's kind of had this on his plate um, to look at it as potential opportunity here in, uh, for our situation. So uh, I will turn it over to Martin and he'll take us into uh, what he's learned about wood wool cement. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Tim, for the kind introduction. Do we have the presentation? There it is. Thank you much. Um, yeah, I put this little disclaimer on the bottom there. Um, it's important, even though I might sound excited. Uh, I'm not re a representative of any of the manufacturers or vendors of the products I will be talking about. Um, and I'll start with a cold open. If I told you that's a building product, track record uh, as a building product over 100 years, um, uses small diameter material, is fire, water, vermin, termite resistant, and white, wet, dry, rot resistant, highly desirable thermal acoustic properties. You can read the rest. What would be your response? A, yeah, right. And I got a bridge to sell you. Yes, I know. Uh, really? How? Why are we not using it? So, who here would answer with B? Good. Well, let's talk about wood wool cement. Wood wool cement um, is a mineral bonded natural fiber. Maybe some of you um, have heard the term Excelsior, and on the left side you see some images. Maybe you've seen this material but didn't know what it was. If it looks a little bit like sauerkraut, you're right on. Um, the inputs are very simple. It's water, it's wood, and it's just ordinary Portland cement. Um, the most common species uh, are pine, spruce, and aspen. Uses small diameter logs anything between 4 and 11 inches, and the logs between 6 and 15 feet. This is the process. I'll go through it very quickly. Um, top left, it's um, cut to length, delivered to the mill, um, debarked, and put back out in the yard to dry 
to a um, moisture content of 25%, let the tannins settle out, then it, it's brought back in, cut into two foot pieces, um, and then goes through the shaver that makes it this, this wool-like texture, and then it goes, gets um, the individual strands get coated with cement, it gets put into molds, pressed, the cement cures, and a whole variety of products comes out at the end. Move on. Yeah. So I brought it, broke it down in three um, categories. One is wood wool cement boards. They're between half an inch and four inches thick. Um, two, to f uh, two by eight in dimensions. Wood wool cement large wall elements. That's a fairly new product. Um, between eight and 16 inches thick, up to 20 feet long, um, 10 feet wide. And then wood wool cement roof boards. The biggest difference between the cement boards and the roof boards is there's a dowel in it that um, gives as much more um, bending strength. And that's how it can be used as, as, um, in roof construction. Some of the properties, um, the R value, 1.87, high specific thermal capacity, so how long can it retain a, a certain temperature from, from the, the ambience? And some uh, specifications that I found in the Veterans Administration uh, master specifications um, you can see here. Some more, it's fire resilient. They did fire testing on this. Um, as I mentioned, water frost termite resistant um, and a relatively low specific weight and lends itself to prefab modular construction. This is a little bit anticlimactic early, early on in this presentation. Um, there is currently no manufacturer in the US. There used to be two on the East Coast. They successfully competed each other out of business. And um, so right now, the US is importing around 450, 480 shipping containers, both from Asia and Europe, of this material. In Europe, there are several, uh, I think about a dozen of these manufacturers. And that's all BC before COVID. I don't know how accurate these numbers are nowadays. There is a similar product um, that um, Armstrong makes, but it's a different um, binder, which does not make it um, suitable for outdoor applications. So with, with moisture and humidity, their material doesn't do so well. Okay, I'm going through some more details. And some of this will be a lookbook, lots of pictures. And just to give you guys a first impression how it can be used in, in the variety of applications. Anywhere there's sound reduction necessary, um, thermal insulation, this is a good product. You can see it in parking garages, swimming pool, where there's high humidity, lots of moisture in the air. Um, top right is a shooting range, lots of noise there. Um, lower left, modern homes have a lot of hard surfaces, a um, lot of echo, and it can get annoying over time, so it's a, it's a material that can be used in, in residential homes as well. On the left side, uh, on the right side, uh, lower right, um, for some more artistic expression, there's a lot of colors and shapes and textures that can be made as well. If you're more in the ag sector, um, top left is a cow barn, cattle barn, top right, um, pigsty, noise, smells um, for, for air quality improvement, there is some, some air permeation possible, and then for, for, for horse barns, riding halls, again, if there's noise, um, if you need humidity controls, it's a good material. And of course, any sort of sport venue. Um, ice rink, um, basketball courts. Lots of textures, lots of colors, if you want to. There's only one manufacturer right now that I'm aware of in um, Scandinavia who has this, this wide range. Usually it's this two by eight panel Uh, 
um, some examples of exterior ex um, uh, application. Um, on the top left, they added some insulation in between, so it's sandwiched in between uh, these wood wool cement boards, um, EPS, foam, and the likes. Um, on the top right, that's a retrofit from an um, uh, old building, and they just put this material on the outside, added some aluminum trim, and make it look somewhat modern and, and thermally insulated. And the bottom part, they built this entire garage um, out of these um, four inch thick panels. It plays well with mass timber. We just had a, heard a great um, presentation. Um, mass timber, CLT, is all the rage um, these days. And this material is a supplement, it's, it's a complement, not a substitute. Um, if you look at mass timber buildings, most of them are not built with just CLT. There's still some steel in there, there's still some concrete in there. Um, why not add some, some wood wool cement that has thermal insulating and, and noise um, abatement capacity? Then over the last few years, a Swedish manufacturer has started making um, large wall elements. So if you know CLT, full wall elements, full size, they are now making this um, out of this wood wall cement material. Um, go through a CNC machine, just like um, CLT panels, cut out windows, doors, um, uh, whatever. You can trim these things to size if you need to on the site with a chainsaw. The chain won't like it, but it's possible. Very similar to CLT. They add these little straps so you can put them on a crane. Piece things together and the only pieces in the concrete are these columns and a ring beam that goes around the top, um, add some rebar. And what I've learned is when engineers, designers spec these buildings, their entire load bearing, everything is based on the concrete. The wood will cement panels are just the icing on the cake structurally. Again, just an impression. So I can go a little quicker here. Then the wood wool cement roof boards, again, very similar to the panels, uh, the, the, the boards, but have these wooden dowels in them. And it, they bring them up to 54, um, pounds per square foot, and, and that's a decent decent number, even in, in, in snowy areas. I'm from California, the Sierras, they get five, six, 10 feet of snow sometimes, and they should hold up well. This is how it goes together. Again, they're, they're two by eight. There's a um, bracket that can go on so you can combine four panels, so you're pretty much building a roof in eight by eight sections and have an, um, um, R value of, of 10 already just by with these wood, uh, with these boards. They put um, Gobi the elephant on it um, several decades ago, um, 4,300 pounds, and it held up. I don't know how long, it's, long it stayed on there. And then some other applications. It's a combination out of the, the boards and the, the um, large wall elements, noise mitigation. along railroads um, in these boards, either between tracks, on the sides of tracks, just wherever you can see a noise barrier along highways, this material works. Again, because it is water resilient, it can um, be in the outdoors, it can be exposed to the elements. Different design options, because often residents who live behind these walls they don't want to just stare at a gray concrete wall. They would prefer something a little bit more interesting and appealing to them, so this provides this, this opportunity. On the far right side, that's a new design that a Dutch um, highway contractor has developed, and um, yeah, I think they're still testing it. Again, for the more design inclined, on the right side, that's screen printed. So you, one can go pretty fa fancy with this. On the lower left, this is the only installation that I know of in the United States um, as a, a noise barrier, as a sound wall barrier. That's on I-5 in California. They use the panels um, that's next, next to a golf course. They 
were about to lose their PGA um, certification because the interstate was too loud. So um, they put these panels in there and that solved the problem. So how much material does actually go into this? Not a whole lot. Um, the consumption is about 20 tons of wood per shift. And so around for, for the year, that's about 6,000 tons. And that's where the US Forest Service people I talk with and in California, they say, well, can you, if you can add zero to this or two zeros, then it becomes exciting. I said, no, this is something that works on a, on a smaller scale, at least in, in terms of um, the, the, the input. The ratio of wood, water, and cement is one to one to two by weight. And so over um, per, per day, you can produce up to 43,000 square feet of this material. Did some more math. On the right side, you see how much goes in per year for a one shift operation. And then I thought, okay, I mean, there's, there's not much of a market or there is no market, certainly because m most people here don't know this material. And so I ran this, this hypothetical for California noise barriers. Um, the state of California um, installs almost 11 miles of sound barriers every single year on average, again, before COVID. Um, if you would make it, these noise barriers out of this material, we could run a plant one shift um, for an entire year and utilize 5,000, 6,000 tons of small diameter woody material, which California has much, much more of and most of your states as well. In terms of sustainability, um, that stuff lasts. I mean, some of it was installed several decades ago in Europe outside, it's still there. Um, one of the challenges, at least in California, is when somebody says cement, people say, ooh, not good. High carbon footprint. Um, question is, where does the cement come from? How do you make it? What's the energy that goes into it? Thank you. And if some of this can shift to renewable resources, the carbon footprint is not so bad anymore. And right now, these noise barriers I mentioned in California currently are 100% concrete. So I think we can change that equation a little bit, um, utilize local small diameter wood, reduce the cement portion, and have some, some elements a little bit more interesting than what's currently being installed. And again, since this is so prevalent in Europe, there's a lot of EPDs available, environmental product declarations, similar to an LCA. Um, so all the, the emissions, all the, the inputs, all the outputs are accounted for. And this is what a facility would take. Um, automation, um, there's a table on the other side of the, um, the building here. Sean is back here as a representative and can talk to you some more about it. Um, this is what it looks like. So these little cookies. Um, yeah, so a building 200 by 600 um, feet. Um, the land between eight to 12 acres to, to store your material, uh, both the input, the, the feedstock, as well as the finished product. Employs between 12 and 22 people per plant per shift. Uh, depends on the level of which product you make, the panels take less than, than the full size, or the, the boards take less than the full size wall elements, um, and, and the level of, of, of um, automation, right? Um, so there are options there as well. And again, the, 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 the cost of just the hardware that does not include the building and, and rolling stock is between six and 17 million. So um, to wrap up, there's a lot of terms we hear about, and I want to see how this material fits into those. Resilient forests and landscapes, yeah, it utilizes small air material, which there's really not much to market for. It's really a chal challenge to make something out of four by 11, uh, four, between four and 11 inches diameter material. 
Once we go bigger, then CLT comes, comes into play. Advanced building construction. It's prefab, it's modular, it's energy efficient, um, uses all natural materials, and contributes to a healthy indoor climate, even in a pigsty. Uh, home hardening. Because this material is fire resistant, um, it can be used as outside cladding, if you will, or you build an entire structure out of it. Um, jobs in the forest sector, as I mentioned before, personnel per shift between 12 and 22. And that's just what's operating at the plant. Um, you still need um, uh, log hauler to, to bring the logs in, um, do the work in the woods. Mass timber engineered, I mentioned it. It's a complement, not a substitute. Okay, these, these two go together. They go very well together. Um, Woodwell cement has characteristics that CLT cannot meet, and vice versa. So CLT is, is structural. Um, Woodwell cement, not so much. But it has um, noise um, capabilities, has, has thermal ca um, capabilities that CLT does not meet. And then the, the term wood products campus is very prevalent in, in California. We've been talking about it for years. Um, how, how can we co-locate different, um, um, different product lines in one location? So each, the next step can utilize the quote unquote waste product of, of the, the previous one. If, if one market isn't doing so well, maybe the market for another product on this campus is still doing all right. So you don't have a one-legged stool, but th this campus can keep operating if it has this, this wider range um, diversity of, of wood products. So why is it not being used more? Okay, so that was my, that was answer C. Um, new buildings ma materials take time. Okay, if you think about CLT, uh, developed early 90s um, in, in, in Germany and Austria, California didn't get it into its code until um, 2020. So these things take time. Um, but as a previous speaker mentioned, we have to talk about these things. We have to present about these things. Um, so, so people know it's out there. And um, yeah, so I hope we can somehow replicate the paths that, that CLT took, that Mass Timber took. Now there are manufacturers in the US. Still a lot of the material that's, that's getting installed in the US in terms of mass timber is still being imported. Um, so, and with that, thank you. All right, just uh, to add a little bit to Martin's presentation, um, myself, Martin, and Carmen are part of a group of um, uh, state biomass specialists and uh, this is a product that we've kind of reached a consensus among our group under the Council of Western State Foresters. We're going to be looking more in depth um, at this product um, addressing a lot of what Martin you know covered briefly in his presentation to look at uh, you know feasibility obviously the design standards and getting it incorporated into our construction industry so um, we should be seeing something uh, additional come out on this product um, in the near future through our group um, coming up pretty soon. So I will introduce our next panelist. Haven't had the opportunity to meet him personally. My understanding is he, uh, by the wonders of technology, will be coming to us online. Um, Bob McElwee, he's with um, RMS Ventures. Um, He's got a good bio on the website. If you'd like to take a look at that, he actually has background in journalism, but he's coming before us here today to talk about the perspectives of commercializing, certainly financing and commercializing a number of different process and technology platforms. Um, I believe he's working closely with a lot of the, um, you know, Arizona Educational uh, University of Arizona and places like that. Um, to bring th these types of perspectives to commercializing several technologies dealing with, uh, again, the theme of low value wood into uh, uh, higher value products. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Damon to cue Bob up.
Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello? Bob, Bob they, uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, I'll begin. Thank you. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Uh, my name is Robert McElwee. I'm uh, uh, CEO of a company called REM Ventures, and we are developers for both products and projects. And some of our development work is for clients, which I'll talk about in a while, some of them are in the Southwest, some are on the East Coast, um, but we also are developing projects and products uh, in the biomass related areas for our own companies and our own projects as well. Over the past 10 years or so, I've worked with biomass and biomass facilities, developing them, um, getting funding for them, helping set up the engineering, the equipment. And during that time, uh, I have come to realize that biomass has become a commodity and now a product of biomass, which is biochar, is also becoming a commodity, which for, from a financial standpoint and, and investors isn't quite as attractive as some other products that we might want to look at, which we will do so in a, in a little bit. Um, what I want to talk about today is for you to think about looking at biomass differently and your position in the uh, supply chain. If you're selling wood chips, you are selling pretty much a commodity. So I'm gonna show you some things that we're doing and some other partners of ours that puts the um, producer in a better position in terms of a partnership or, or possible uh, collaboration. My prediction, and this is not based on my gut feeling, but I've been working the past two years with some uh, large entities in, in terms of a partnership for the products you're about to see. And they, they predict that in 23, 24, there's gonna be a high need for residual biomass, um, small wood biomass, uh, biomass residuals for some of the products that we are about to produce. So this transition, um, uh, it can be in predictions, it can be in um, articles, but I'm going to show you some of the things that are about to happen in 2022 that have real customers and that are real products. A little bit about um, what we do and, and what biomass has served uh, in terms of a product in the past. Um, biomass can be a supply component or ingredient for some exciting new products. And um, to make this happen for these larger customers, we have to have a couple of elements, and I'm gonna stress those in my presentation. One is we have to have the supply. And uh, the previous presentation, it's a very exciting product and it fits smaller markets or, or, or smaller amounts of biomass. But some of what I'm about to show you requires larger amounts, anywhere from 50,000 tons a year to 300,000 tons a year or higher. But there are ways to um, trim this down and, and minimize um, the capital expenditure needed. The short presentation here I'm about to give you makes this all look really easy and that these things just appeared. But I can assure you after you see them, Th these have been years in the making, and this is the first time I have publicly um, shown these products. Some of them will be announced in the near future, um, not by me, they'll be announced by um, my larger partners, but we will have played the role in producing them. And then some of the smaller products will have um, our company name on it. The first one I'm gonna talk about is uh, renewable fuel plants. and. That goes back to what I just said. And renewable fuel for me, I've been involved with uh, renewable diesel plants and with hydrogen plants. That, that's really where my expertise lies. And those facilities can take anywhere from 50,000 to 300,000 tons a year of biomass. Uh, it can be uh, residual, but the important thing is that it's consistent. And we can talk about the specs offline and 
everything else and the species that goes into it. But basically, it's important to have a consistent feedstock. And I'm going to give you an example of one that's in Arizona we're working on. That's with a municipality that's very exciting. Um, we're going to combine uh, residual biomass there, 70,000 tons a year, of uh, the species juniper. And it's an MSW facility, which means we will separate the wood products and the paper products from the plastics and uh, the, the part of the MSW that has to go to a landfill, which is about 15%. But the rest of it, we recycle, or we use the, the, the wood products from that MSW and we create energy pellets, and then we make renewable diesel out of it. But to supplement that, we're planning to use 70,000 tons a year of uh, juniper, which is basically a, a, a nuisance species in Arizona and other states. So this is one creative way to take care of one problem to create renewable fuel, but the important co-product here that we will utilize, my group, um, other than developing this project, uh, I will be the purchaser of the biomass which comes off of that pyrolysis process. So for example, if you have a plant that produces 7 million tons, uh, 7 million gallons a year of diesel fuel, there's about 13,000 tons of high quality biochar that comes off of, as a co-product. So one of the things that we look for when we're looking for a customer as a developer for a location, there's transportation, there's supply, uh, there's many, many factors, but two of the most important ingredients or factors that you start with, first is you have to have a customer if you don't have a customer, you don't have anything else. And then also with the supply, while supply is important, equally important is the supply chain. So that includes the companies that are supplying that biomass um, to the customer, to the plant, and not just for one year or a short term, term of two to three years, but if a customer is gonna invest 40 to $100 million, they wanna know it's gonna be there for 20 years. And that, therein lies a challenge. So um, there are regions of the country where there, there is lots of biomass available, like Arizona. But the challenge is there's, there aren't enough really solid entities there that can harvest it as one unit, um, like a Plum Creek or, or, or some kind of other timber operation. So in regions like that, you have to put together a consortium of producers, suppliers who can meet that need uh, for that long-term uh, need for the renewable fuel. So that's one example of one of the larger types of operations. And again, I'm working on two in the Southwest um, and we're, we're just about where we need to be to be able to launch. So that's very exciting. The other project that we're working on is not diesel, it's um, in Colorado and uh, we're gonna take dairy manure and uh, we'll make renewable diesel out of it. We know we can do that. The uh, co-product from that is also a biochar-like material. We're testing it right now to see if it will be, will be suitable to make um, um, other products out of it. But the feedstocks are so different that it may not test out to be as desirable as uh, biomass, but that remains to be seen. Um, but all of these products together produce biochar, and that's an important component in what we're working on for the future. So let me explain, most of you probably know what biochar is. Um, it's, if I give you a simple definition, it's just biomass taken to varying levels of temperature to create a carbon product that can be used in other products and manufacturing. Over the past five to six years, I've been working with our own facilities to produce biochar. And some of the early uses that we're um, utilizing it with now are from an agricultural standpoint. You can see the manure pellets we have there uh, on the screen. Uh, I'll tell you more about that in a moment, uh, which is 
geared to a much smaller operation. But now we have my REM team and partners, we've been able to um, move biochar, not just move it, but transform it from the biochar state to, um, uh, to graphitizing it, uh, which means that we can take it to a level of graphene oxide, which opens up a whole new uh, area of products. But for the biochar itself, some of the uses are we can put it in paints when it's, when it's graphitized and not quite graphene. Uh, we can use it in filtration. Uh, but again, this process, we've proven it. Now we're getting ready to commercialize it with a plant. Um, and this will be a game changer because right now, biochar, uh, I'm sorry, graphene is made through an acidic process from the mineral graphite. So I just wanted to hit on how important biochar is as the next step from that residual biomass. Graphene, many, uh, just as little as a couple years ago, was still kind of uh, in its infancy, but in the last two years, it has skyrocketed in terms of importance. And he here's the dilemma for these companies that are going to be using graphene, both in paints and coatings, um, in uh, EV batteries, uh, and now we're able to use it in cement uh, to make it as much as 25% stronger. Uh, which means we use 25% less uh, to get the same tensile and compressive strength. So there's an exciting future here for, bio, uh, for graphene. But again, here's the, the dilemma. If we utilize biochar to make graphene sustainably, then that means that we're going to have to have a large, large supply of, uh, of uh, biochar which means we're gonna to have to have a large amount of residual biomass or other material to make that from. So it's very exciting future for residual biomass and it's coming 23, 24. That's when these uh, factories and manufacturing facilities, according to the folks we work with, will start using this from a volume standpoint. Now let's bring this down to um, the early stages of biochar and one of the exciting uses. And um, this has probably been the most exciting thing for me personally the last two years. We've been working with biochar for two years in trials. Uh, I just got results today from an organic farmer on the East Coast with sweet potatoes, and I'll be publishing that on my website. But we've gotten some amazing results, uh, sometimes as much as two times to three times yields and shorter growing times with high dollar uh, volume crops like um, organic veg vegetables, uh, marijuana, and hemp. So we're excited to be announcing um, those results here in the near future. And it's a very simple combination. We take the biochar, the best combination is usually 10 to 20%, and we mix it with chicken manure and we pelletize it. It's easy to apply, it's easy to handle. Uh, and Manure fertilizer isn't anything new pelletized, but the results of combining it with biochar are just tremendous. This is an example of uh, mine tailings um, on a hillside. And I have lots of examples of this, but the biochar helps retain moisture and nutrients. And over time, it brings back the full value of what it once was or taking it higher than most people think possible for low value land like this. This is one of uh, our projects that is strictly ours. REM is a partner in a new um, sustainable building company. And if you haven't um, looked at what it, it looks like to print homes now um, with concrete, uh, the advancements that have been made in the past couple of years have been tremendous. Um, my group is making a, a large investment on the East Coast. Um, we're going to two other states and to Central America in the coming year. And we're going to build various types of um, printed homes. And biochar will play, biomass, biochar will play an important role in these homes because, again, we'll use sustainable concrete. Concrete, as you 
all know probably is one of the biggest offenders from a carbon standpoint. So we want to create a carbon zero home. Um, and the most exciting advantages to these homes that we're going to be building is that we can do it in a third of the time for half the cost for the same square footage. But keep in mind also, the printer does not print the whole thing. It prints the walls, it prints the exterior, and it can print some of the uh, other components of the property. Um, you could also print a giant like you see in this picture. This is a little bit more of a modern home in the Southwest. Um, you could print a concrete roof, but uh, we're using truss roofs. So it's really a combination um, of two different forms of uh, construction. And right now we're looking at, we our, our first location, we have a uh, order for a hundred homes and we're looking at hundreds more. So uh, it's very exciting. And I think this will be something um, of the future. This is probably the most exciting slide, I think, for us at REM because this touches on many different areas that we've been working on for years now. Uh, one is sustainable concrete. Uh, we know from our tests that we can do it. We just need to commercialize it, and that's taking the, the biochar and um, taking it to uh, graphene oxide, and then we can take it further from there if we want to take it to a higher level of graphene. Um, right now, we're going to start out with traditional concrete, and then we'll move to that in 20, later in 2022, but that's very exciting. The sustainable furnishings, uh, some of our uh, furniture that we're having some um, designers and um, fabrication shops uh, work on, we'll be taking um, something as simple as wood chips um, and, and some other sustainable wood products, wood waste, and making um, product out of it. It won't require a lot of material at first, but we hope to, hope to provide these sustainable um, products to go in our uh, new homes. Um, but, uh, BioGIP is an insulation product we're developing right now that um, has been used in some homes in Mexico. It's a carbon negative product. It's made from biochar and some other ingredients that are um, natural to most areas of the country. It's fireproof and termite proof. And what we're doing with the biogyp is when we print these concrete homes or print these homes, um, we do a double wall for some construction depending on where they are in terms of earthquakes or hurricanes and what strength is needed but we put that product in between those walls. It provides a tremendous um, insulation product. And again, it's all sustainable. The RenewCrete product um, right now doesn't have a lot of biochar in it. We're using um, uh, construction finds to create uh, decorative blocks and uh, blocks that are not load bearing that we can utilize with our homes. And we're working with several um, recovery facilities on the East Coast to, uh, to begin this operation. The thermal paint, uh, we haven't added the graphene yet to it, but um, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's a paint that can provide insulation, but it's all sustainable, made from all sustainable pro products. So those are just some of the things that we're gonna, going to announce about mid-2022. Uh, uh, again, all from sustainable products. The long-term solution for biomass, uh, residual biomass, um, again, I, I go back to my original statement. Um, we have to have a strong customer and a strong supply chain. And if it's possible in your area or wherever you work uh, with biomass to get involved in the, in, in the supply chain, uh, I guess, further down the line, because you're at the beginning of, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> at the beginning of the line rather than at the end, just supplying the straight biomass. So that's the approach we've taken. We've worked for years in um, 
biomass production in manufacturing facilities, but now we've involved ourselves with larger customers at the, at the other end of the spectrum so that we're at the table with the, the sustainability director who now for most companies sits to the right of the CEO. And sustainability is becoming more and more important every day. And it's not because these companies care. Um, I'm sure they do personally, but those companies care about sales and people now, consumers care about sustainability. So if you have a product uh, that has biochar uh, that um, has been converted to graphene and is in the tennis racket, is in the tennis shoes, uh, batteries, if it's sustainable, it will be, have an advantage over that product that was made with an acidic process that wasn't sustainable um, using graphite. So that's where the advantage is for us, those of us who believe in sustainability and believe in using the residual biomass and other materials that we have to create value added products. So uh, I guess in summary, I would say uh, here in the US, we need to bring academia and we need to bring government together and we need to be, bring industry. And I can tell you right now that industry is interested. We, we would have their, we have their ear in terms of sustainability, but again, it all goes to the supply chain. So the past two years when I've been talking to companies about these products, the first question is, does it work? And if I can prove that, then the second question is, tell me about your supply chain. How are you going to fill our needs for a facility? And that doesn't mean that all of them have to be mega facilities. There can be smaller units, which we've been working on in terms of paints and coatings that are sustainable, and they can be near the source of the biomass, as long as there's transportation and all the other ingredients. So. Uh, in conclusion, I, I just want to say, think sustainable, but think supply chain. I'm at a disadvantage because I can't really see the audience or um, get to see you face to face, but I appreciate you listening to my presentation today. And I just wanted to say in closing, uh, again, if everyone does their part, we can change the world sustainably and um, economically. Um, if anyone has um, a, um, a question, I'll be available during the Q&A session, and you can email me at the address on the screen, and um, I'll send out monthly updates if you want to get on that list, and I'll let you know when products are coming out. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, stay on, and uh, we will get to that uh, Q&A later. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, it was pretty exciting to see the increasing diversity of um, products, technologies, and customers that uh, really in the near future biomass uh, may have a contribution towards. So um, we'll Thank move you. on to our final panelists. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with Forest Concepts. They're out of Washington. Uh, Pre-pandemic, these guys, I, I became aware of them, a lot of at the conferences on wood utilization. They over the past have generated a variety of innovative products and processes getting at you know the residuals from our forest management activities residual jewels from our sawmill primary manufacturing processes so um, they're here to uh, give us uh, kind of tell us a story about um, wood straw I have a particular professional interest one of our uh, that product was um, has just come to Colorado. We have a licensed company, Northwest Colorado, that we've been working with uh, over the years as a startup. Um, and we're starting to see success with that product. Um, our post-fire debris flow situations, uh, you know, if you've been watching the news lately, I-70s, um, it's not uncommon for that major corridor through Colorado to be um, um, basically closed for a number of days, number of weeks resulting from the post-fire debris flows. And uh, fortunately, the product that Forest Concepts helped develop 
and now that we have a, a manufacturing presence in Colorado, um, has seen some success with his products. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jason Malone before his concepts, and he'll tell us a little bit more about uh, wood straw. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join you guys today. Uh, as he mentioned, we have a partner in Colorado. I'm with the partner in Washington called Erosion Control Innovations. Uh, my name is Jason Lalone, and we are partnered with Forest Concepts, who was, as you mentioned, the originator, the designer of wood straw. Um, so this is going to be a presentation about wood straw, just giving you more detail about the product itself. Um, so yeah. Oh, I got the clicker. <laughs> Um, some of the key points that was that brought it on in the first place was we needed a, something that was weed and seed free, chemical free, um, and could withstand high winds, and was natural, wasn't going to harm the environment. Uh, so it's made from 100% pure wood. Uh, what is it? So it is a specifically designed, engineered, all wood, um, long strand erosion control material. It was four years in the making. Um, a hundred different iterations before they came to this dimension that's, gonna, that's passing around the room there. Uh, a blend of two different lengths of strands. It's six inch and a two and a half inch, and it's a 50-50 blend, and that's what they found to be the most effective for creating a, that protective matrix that holds in place and keeps, it, and keeps the soil protected, keeps the seeds protected, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it acts, acts and, and um, functions just like agricultural straw. Uh, without the uh, negative side effects. Uh, we, it's from low value uh, waste or scrap veneer. The, the veneer that gen generally gets set aside and turned into mulch. We take that and we turn that into wood straw. Uh, we package it into two different sized bales, uh, regular size bales for more of a hand application process. And then we have large bales for large acreage projects that generally they'll use helicopters to fly with. Um, just like I, I, I mentioned, it's just like agricultural straw. You can uh, apply it just like with a straw blower by hand or a helicopter. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of the uh, agencies that help support the production or the uh, research and development of it. And then this, I just wanted to show you this. This is kind of like the, the process that we go through the supply chain With er erosion control innovations, we have a logging division, um, RCR logging. So we contract with the Forest Service to, to get logs, and we sell the logs to local veneer plants. They take them, create veneer, and then their scrap veneer we buy back from them. So it's a nice little cycle there. Uh, take that scrap veneer, and uh, that picture came up here, sorry, I apologize for that. That is uh, a, a, a part of our facility there in Enumclaw, Washington. Um, we have well, Forest Concepts created the equipment, the proprietary equipment to turn the veneer into wood straw. Uh, it's called a wood muncher and then we have a conveyor system that sends it to the baler. And uh, then we have bales that are sent out to the whatever project you're working on. Um, a lot of times it's w post wildfire restoration. Um, and I'll actually get into that list as well. So, some of the benefits of it: it's a very, it's a high-performance erosion control material, 100% um, weed and seed-free. Uh, chemicals, pesticides, it's all. It, we with uh, the Enum Claw, the Washington facility, we source Douglas fir mostly, um, but also some hemlock. I know in the Colorado facility, they he's tried to use that, but I think he also uses a lot of pine as well. Um, so anything soft that you can take and turn into veneer is, is usable. And we try to use green, fresh wood, um, gives it a little more longevity. Uh, it's, it's on the USDA bio-preferred list. Uh, resistant, that's one of the big things, it's resistant to high winds. Uh, we've seen it withstand winds. In, in the uh, wind tunnel testing, it was up to 50 miles per hour, but we've seen it withstand winds as high as 60 or 70 miles per hour sometimes. 
Uh, it can be effective on steeper slopes as well. So um, I, I've seen it on up to 70% slope, um, and then you generally use a little bit more coverage, which I'll get into. Uh, you can apply it before or after seeding. So if you've already seeded, you can go ahead and apply it, or if not, if you wanted to get it down to, to you know, prevent erosion, but you didn't get to the seeding yet, you can always apply the seeding afterwards, and it, it falls into place nicely and is held into place. Um, it's very good at promoting revegetation. Uh, it helps to m maintain the mo moisture content in the soil, keeps the seeds from blowing away, keeps the uh, you know, the animals don't like don't eat it, uh, so it, it kind of stays off it. You can walk on it; it's durable. You can walk on it, drive on it. Uh, it lasts a long time. It lasts four plus years. It's basically just the decay of wood over time. Um, it during the production process, it also we filter out the fines and the dust so that when you take it out to the field, when you're applying it by hand, there's minimal dust problem for the, uh, for the crew. And also, because of the, uh, the, the effectiveness of it during wind erosion, it prevents dust problems from wind. So it, it actually can help minimize dust down to the PM10 level. Uh, easily applied by hand, like I said, blower and helicopter, and it looks good. So. Uh, functionality, uh, basically, as you can see the, the shapes of it, it's, um, it's specifically designed with two different lengths. So the longer lengths are, lengths are purpose, their purpose is to create that locking matrix. And then the shorter pieces kind of fall in between. So fall, fall down and lock in down in between on the soil. And that creates, in a way, like little mini dams and helps hold the seeds in place and that kind of stuff. So, and the, uh, they're really effective at breaking up the raindrops to prevent raindrop erosion. Uh, it's really effective against rill erosion, uh, creation of rills, and also, you know, growth of rill erosion. Uh, sheet flow, it prevents sheet flow, wind erosion, all that kind of stuff. As an example of a wind, st wind study test we did, uh, comparing it to agricultural straw in this case, Whereas you could see the agricultural straw would start to move at 15 miles per hour and would be blown away at you know, not even 20 miles per hour. Whereas with this, you can generally expect it to hold up into the 40s and 50s. Um, I, I've seen it hold even higher than that. Uh, but this was in a wind test tunnel, which it, the max speed we were able to, to achieve was 51 miles per hour. So you can see how much more effective it is at higher winds. Um, the, uh, the, this is the, the suggested coverage, and this was through the co cooperation of the U.S. Forest Service. We were able to figure these out. These are the best ranges. It's anywhere from 50% to 70% soil coverage. And as you can see, 70% is recommended on higher, steeper slopes, on critical areas, on sensitive areas, uh, or high, you know, areas affected by high winds, consistent winds. And then for General areas, less steep areas, you can 50% is more than sufficient. And what that means, and, and most of you probably know what that means, but just in case, uh, when you're talking 50% soil coverage, it's 50% of the uh, the material is covering 50% of the ground. So you can see 50% of the soil through the gr uh, the wood straw, and then 70%, you can see 30% of the soil through the wood straw. You're talking less than an inch thick. So where you know agricultural straw, you have to put it multiple inches thick in order for it to be effective. This is real thin material. You don't need much of it. So it, well, one bale can go a lot further. Um, as you can see, 70%, you're looking at 280 regular bales for an acre of coverage, or 24 large bales at 50%. It's 160 bales per acre, or 13 large bales. And then uh, I have numbers for, if it's a smaller project, we can figure out for square footage instead of acreage as well. Uh, some examples of what, uh, where it's been used successfully up to this point. Uh, a lot of fire rehabilitation, post-fire suppression repair, um, watershed improvements, road, and road repair and restoration, vineyards, uh, mine land reclamation, even ski resorts. Uh, I've got a nice ski resort we sell to in, in Oregon there that use it quite often. Um, construction projects, green habitat, you know, the list goes on. Anything that has to do with 
the movement of soil or needing to protect you know, for revegetation purposes, that kind of stuff, it's very effective for it. And these are some of the uh, regulatory approvals that we have in place already. Um, at, uh, just like the, the DOT, Department of Transportation for, mo for a few states, uh, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, USDA Bio Preferred, uh, Department of Ecology for best management practices. Um, it's, it meets the requirements, is, which is what initiated this in the first place was the Forest Service, the BLM, they wanted something that was weed and seed free, you know, chemical free, that didn't add anything to the soil that we didn't want it to be there. So it meets all those requirements. Um, and, and, and as well as invasive species prevention, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I just wanted to post some pictures of you for you to see is some examples of where it's been used and what it looks like. And I can't remember, I wish I would put the names on, I can't remember what you, where each of these locations were, I apologize for that. The, uh, then we have like the top left, you're using a standard straw blower to apply it there, just along the side of the road. Or the, t the bottom left, this is actually a helicopter project where they're dropping it by helicopter. Um, and they've gotten really good at that. They can, they can spread it out really nice and balanced. It's pretty impressive what they do. Or by hand in the bottom right. And then of course, just like with straw, we set, we, the best way to ship it is by flatbed. And we can do 24 regular bales on a standard pallet or three large bales on a standard pallet. Um, a little bit more about the equipment before I end here, a little bit more about the equipment and the facility. So one an another nice thing about it is it's all electric. There's no fuel, there's no, ex there's no pollution from exhaust or anything like that. It's all run by electricity. We can, uh, with the regular bales on an eight hour shift, we can uh, run that with two crew, with two people. So it doesn't require a lot of manpower. The large bales require a little bit more. We can, um, on an eight hour shift, we can run it with four to five people. So it's, you know, depending on the scale, as, as we scale it up, we need to, we'll need to ramp that up a little more, but uh, it doesn't require a lot of manpower and it, it's uh, pretty efficient as far as the production process goes. So um, that's my information. If you have any questions or you wanna reach out to me, feel free to at any time. And that's what I have for you today. Thank you. Right. Um, I think I'm, uh, I'm should have grabbed him before he went back to his table, but uh, I invite Martin and Jason if you want to come up and we'll have our Q&A session. And I presume Bob is uh, with us as well online. So um, why don't we go around our live audience initially for questions. Um, Martin. I know you and I will have to talk later, but currently there's nobody in the United States making the product that you demonstrated. Because we, I actually think we might have an application for it right now. Yeah, that's correct. So the only similar one is the, the Armstrong Pectin product, but it's not outdoor rated. Okay. So Thank you. Uh, other questions from those of us? Oh, in the back corner, Rich. Yes, I have a question for Mr. Bob. Um, your, your Black Rooster Organics, uh, you mentioned that you're making that with uh, poultry waste. And uh, for the pallets, um, can that also be used with, with cow manure for, to enhance the uh, fertilization for the soil? Uh, it could be. Um, poultry manure is so much uh, superior to <clears throat> cow manure and horse manure from a nitrogen and nutrient standpoint. Uh, I don't know of many people who pelletize cow manure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go to a couple of questions from our online audience. Uh, so uh, this is a question for Martin. How long uh, does it take to dry the logs uh, after you debark them? Um, what I heard from the European um, producers, uh, six months, four months. I mean, it depends on ambient temperature, right? I mean, if, if humidity is low in general, then it goes faster. 
but they try to hit the 25% moisture content. So between four and six months. And I think another part is if you use um, softwood, that the tannins need to settle down a little bit just for the, for the chemical reaction to happen properly. Thank you. Uh, two more questions for you, Bob. Uh, is there a waste uh, pr uh, is there any waste produced when you uh, transform a biochar into graphene? If so, can it be used for another purpose? No. When we <coughs> excuse me, when we transfer or transform biochar to graphene, we get about a twenty percent loss. It's basically a heat process uh, and another process, but there's no loss. Uh, I mean, there's no additional leftover product. Is that what you're asking? That is correct. Okay. Okay, uh, to uh, uh, follow up on that, actually, uh, to produce biochar that is uh, suitable to make a graphene, to make a graphene, can you use uh, needles and bark? Um, <clears throat> Yes, you could, you could uh, as long as you're consistent. Like I said before, the input needs to be consistent all the time. So if it's if it's manure all the time, manure. If it's biomass that is like juniper and pine mixed, which is what we use in Arizona, then again, it just needs to be consistent. Thank you. All right, um, go back to our live audience. Excellent presentations. Uh, Jason, what type of equipment is necessary for the wood straw? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, it's actually, it's proprietary equipment that, <coughs> excuse me, that was designed by Forest Concepts. Uh, I don't know if, you, if any of you ever heard of some of their other products. One of them is called the Crumbler. Well, they've taken, this was the original version of the Crumbler, um, so they've taken and redesigned it a little bit, but uh, it's, in essence, a large paper shredder, in, in a way, to be very simple in the explanation of it. Um, so that's the type of equipment for creating the uh, the strands. And then it, we, we've modified some basic baler systems to, to for the final result. Does that uh, answer your question? Thank you. Question from for Bob. Where are you getting the juniper? Um, is it off a national forest or is it um, private? The first stage of our process will, uh, for that project I talked about, will be um, private. Um, depending on who the customer is, uh, for example, we don't get credits if we're using it for renewable fuel. We don't get the California credits that we need if it's from U.S. Forest Service land. Um, that's a restriction in the current regulations right now. But the answer to your question is it, it would be private right now, um, but we would hope to move to that because we're working on getting that amended uh, in terms of the EPA. But anything with the EPA takes a long time. So right now, private. Other questions from for our panelists? Okay, uh, I check back with Dame just to see if anything's come in online. Okay, um, and I think I'll turn it over to Han. He'll talk to us about a little bit of the logistics surrounding lunch and um, give a applause to our panelists for. <laughs> Excellent presentations and some opportunities that I think uh, each of us in this room will be interested in exploring further. So with that, I'll let Han describe how we're handling lunch. Uh, th thank you, uh, team. Uh, that's a great uh, panel right there. So one thing, actually, I'd like to share uh, my own thoughts about the presentation I've seen uh, this morning that uh, the um, uh, I don't remember now. The, uh, some of you uh, uh, made a comment about the business cluster, uh, to utilizing all the components uh, of the uh, tree. So um, 
the, I think the, um, instead of the one single industry making single products, if we can have uh, uh, companies make uh, the many different companies uh, uh, utilizing different components of the uh, wood parts, I think that will really make nicely uh, uh, utilize all the material, uh, including limbs and branches, uh, to produce uh, many different kinds of products. Uh, the, um, uh, and the, all these companies can be one located uh, can be located one loca uh, one location. We're talking about business cluster or business campus. So uh, I think some of them, uh, some of you mentioned that. I think that idea has a really good value. So I think they uh, we uh, hopefully we have, you know we see that kind of things is more happening like some place like a Gallup here in New uh, New Mexico or uh, Camp Navajo uh, in Arizona as some places uh, the uh, Colorado. So see if we can have some kind of business cluster. Uh, uh, I think that will be really uh, uh, has a good concept in it. So hopefully that happens. Um, uh, again, I'd like to thank you all to the uh, presenters and uh, for a great presentation and uh, audience and uh, you interact with a lot of good stuff. Uh, the uh, good questions and comments, that's great. So uh, we are now getting into the uh, lunch.